What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Pick 6 Podcast, CBS Sports Daily NFL Podcast. I'm Will Brinson. I'm your host. It's Wednesday, June 24th. Uh, we're rolling right along on our All 32 series. Uh, we're going we're gonna to try and hit all 32 teams in the NFL. It feels like we might actually get it done, which is impressive since we don't uh, do many things all the way on this podcast. Uh, but to... Uh, to uh, to knock out one of the AFC West teams, my my ex girlfriend team, the uh, the Los Angeles Chargers, joined now by Daniel Popper, the Athletic at Daniel R Popper on Twitter. Daniel, thanks for joining us, man. Of course, I, I noticed that you made almost made the cardinal sin of calling them the San Diego Chargers, and we would have had to restart I, the podcast over. I, I did. Uh, <laughs> there's a hundred percent chance that when we do the Raiders, which I don't think we've done. Or maybe we don't. If we did, if I was doing the Raiders, I'd call them the Oakland Raiders. Like, like I'm, I'm still. The San Diego thing is still getting me, even like f- three years in, four years in. Yeah. It's not just you. I mean, it's the referees too. It happens. Yeah. Pretty much every game, you'll get a, you know, false start, number seventy five. San, San Diego Chargers. Yeah. Everyone in the, and there's an audible groan from the press box every time. Like, ah. How hard is this? Like, well, we're in well, Los Angeles right now. I think that's true. Yeah, it's like, look around you at the empty, <laughs> yeah. tiny stadium here. What hotel are you staying in? Like, come on. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. That's a good point. I will say that I think that this year may be the final turning point for calling them the Los Angeles Chargers because my guy, Philip Rivers, no longer in the building. Um, you, uh, you know, you've, you've been one of the Chargers beat for – was it was last year your first year on the Chargers beat? Yeah, it's – Pretty much a year, yeah. I started training yeah. camp last season. So, I mean, it's it's a totally different team, right? Like a different organization. I mean, I know the same city now, but it does feel like maybe the Rivers thing is the final, like, like final transition to LA because he never bought in. I mean, he was he was yeah, no, he was, he was a San Diego guy. Yeah, no, and, and that was an issue internally. You know, they wanted him to be the face of the franchise. They wanted him to do these community events in Los Angeles. They wanted him to be present in the community, and he just never bought in. Uh, you know, he would make speeches in San Diego and would never make speeches in Los Angeles. And the team is obviously really ready to to make this transition. It's it's coming from the top down. Ownership really wants this thing to work. Um, And so you're going to start to see them sort of shift to, you know, some new faces, you know, a guy they love to bring out and show to the community is Derwin James. You know, he's gregarious. He's, he's outgoing. He's, he's a very interesting dude. Not, not to mention one of the best defensive players in football. Um, And then you have a, a rookie quarterback now and they're going to market him big time throughout Los Angeles. And he sort of has that, you know, West coast Cali vibe, obviously a pack yeah. guy from Oregon. He was a chargers fan growing up. He's got those flowing golden locks. You know, he has that kind of California vibe that they're looking for and they're kind of trying to rebrand. But you know, the thing that <clears throat> general manager Tom Telesco keeps saying over and over again, I don't know if he's doing this on purpose, but he keeps calling it sort of a new era of chargers football. And it doesn't really matter which way you cut it. It's a new era. They've got a new quarterback. They're going to have a new offense. They're going to be playing in a brand new stadium. And you're exactly right. It seems like Philip Rivers throws that, that last straw, that last connection to San Diego. And now they can really begin this transition in earnest in, in a huge market where it's going to be really hard to make a dent. And no one's really sure if they're going to be able to make a dent until, you know, five, maybe 10 years down the road. Okay, so I have lots of questions stemming from that. But let's start with the offensive side on before we do offense and then break and then do defense. Um, Her, Justin Herbert drafted six overall. Uh, were you surprised? I mean, I know that it was – there were a lot of connections that were made leading up to the draft. I thought they were smoke screening with their depth chart. Like, all right, we're just going to have Tyrod Taylor and, and uh, Easton Stick on here and convince everybody. Like, so everybody thinks we're taking a quarterback, but then we're going to pump fake him and take, like, a, a stud defensive player. They didn't do it. I mean, they took the quarterback. You, you felt all along that was the guy they were going to take. Yeah, I did four mock drafts, and every single one of them I had Herbert going to them at six. Um, you know, ultimately, like – in the NFL media specifically, we do a lot of overthinking, especially in the lead up to the draft, because we have nothing to talk about for two months. And we just speculate and speculate and speculate and, and talk ourselves and think ourselves into circles. It's like, well, what, what if this happens? What if that happens? The right, like you said, the writing was always on the wall. Like they were never, they're never going into this season with Tyra, with decent stake as their backup quarterbacks. So they were, it was, it was tailor made for them to go draft a pun, quarterback. Pun intended. I don't even know what, what pun did I Taylor make? Taylor made. Oh, there you go. Well, yeah. it's spelled differently, so but yeah, I guess oh, I guess true, we can count that. <laughs> I guess we could count that as a pun. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, it was always it was always going to be a, a quarterback at six. It was just a question of which quarterback was going to be there. And I think Tom Telesco, as the general manager and head decision maker, would have been fine with either guy. Um, they they he said that they had you know checked two out on his medicals and they were fine with with where he was at. 
Um, but they also loved Herbert and, and he does a lot of the things that Anthony Lynn is trying to do. And it's sort of this weird dynamic where, you know, Anthony Lynn, like the offense he wants to run is like what, you know, what the Ravens are running in Baltimore. He worked with Greg Roman in, in Buffalo in 2015, 2016, before Greg Roman got mm-hmm. fired. And then Anthony Lynn took over to, as offensive coordinator and they had that meteoric rise where he, you know, then became, uh, you know, interim head coach after Rex Ryan got, Rex Ryan got fired and then he became the Chargers head coach. But he, he wants a lot of quarterback movement. He wants bootlegs. He wants zone reads. He wants to, you know, the RPOs. He wants to incorporate a lot of that modern, you know, offensive schematic stuff that that's sort of sweeping the league right now. And so, but Philip Rivers obviously couldn't do that. <laughs> no, no, he you know, can't. Any right? Any good coach is going to, you know, mold his offense, defense, his scheme around with the players he has. So Anthony Lynn comes in in 2017. He's got a, you know, arguably a future Hall of Fame quarterback, you know, under center. And so you're going to create your offense in that image. You're going to create your offense around Phillip Rivers and see if it works. Uh, but they sort of had this opportunity here where he's on the final year of his deal. We're not going to extend him in the offseason leading up to it. And we'll see how he plays. And we'll give him a shot to win a Super Bowl with a really good roster. It didn't work out primarily because of injuries, but also because Phillip Rivers didn't live up to standards. And now they had this perfect transition where they had Tyrod Taylor under contract on like a really cheap deal for a starting quarterback. It's cap it's like $7.5 million this season. Uh, and they end up with a really high pick, and it sort of all worked out to the point where now you can sort of shift this entire thing forward and have a guy in Justin Herbert that you think can be the quarterback of the future. Okay, so I'm curious what you think about what they will do. And I, 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 I think the RPO stuff and the quarterback movement thing is really interesting because, in my opinion, and I, I don't know where Anthony Lynn stands in terms of his – the warmth of his seat because he did only win five games last year. They haven't been great. It does feel like – like Tom Telesco and that organization loves him in in part part because of who he is as a person, even off the field. But it felt like a little bit like he was going all he, 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 I feel this is my, my theory that he has told the chargers, give me 16 games with Tyrod Taylor. I'm telling you, I can win a super bowl with 16 games with Tyrod Taylor. He's all in, right? Is that, is that fair to say? That's the pitch. I mean, that, that has to be the pitch because there's no way you can go into the season with Taylor as your starting quarterback unless you think he can win a Super Bowl. I right. don't think he can win a Super Bowl, right. but Anthony Lynn certainly does, and he spent a lot more time with Taylor than I have. He won with the guy in Buffalo in 2016. They put together a solid season um, with, with Anthony Lynn calling plays, and we're doing a lot of that stuff. And, you know, it really came down to one thing over everything else, and it was that Anthony Lynn's the, – the pillar of his coaching philosophy is – don't turn the ball over and force turnovers. And you're going to win a lot of games in the NFL. It's really simple, but it's true. You look at, you can pretty much align the turnover differential with the standings in the NFL every season. I mean, obviously there's going to be a few outliers, but that's pretty much what it comes down to. And Philip Rivers, as, as great as he was at so many things, he you was can, never you can going disparage, to... You can disparage Philip Rivers. On this no, I, think I won't get upset. I won't get upset. No, well, I have to qualify it because now he's playing behind the best offensive line of football, and yeah. it's probably going to be a lot better than he was last season. Like, I think he has some good football left in him, but he, he needs the right setting at this age. I, ironically, um, also, I think, ironically, I think he needs the offense that Anthony Lynn wants to run in terms of being run heavy and limiting right. turnovers. And I think he'll do the, that in, yeah. in Indianapolis, but that's a different story. Right, but you, but you need to factor in that like you run, you run heavy, and then you have a lot of play action. And right. Philip Rivers was never going to be a great play action quarterback. He just doesn't move that well. Yeah. But it, you know the things he does well, he does as well as anyone in the history of football. His anticipation and just like his moxie. I know it's an overused word, but like you know just his 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 competitiveness, how tenacious he is on the field in terms of just like wanting to do everything to win. But that is also his downfall yeah. because he's going to force the ball into tight windows every single time, and he's not going to apologize for it ever. <laughs> no, he's and not. He's, He's going to walk off the field and be like, that was me doing everything I could. I, I'm always going to do everything I can for my teammates. And if that means throwing an interception on fourth and 18 when I'm down seven points trying to win a game, then that's what it is. But that mentality is just like a gridlock with what Anthony Lynn wants. Mm. Anthony Lynn wants Tyrod Taylor. Yeah. Tyrod Taylor, listen to this, okay? This is the stat I throw out every interview I do. He is the second best quarterback in the history of football at not throwing interceptions. Of all quarterbacks with a 1,000 or more, passing attempts in their career he is second in the league behind aaron Rodgers. Wow. I, see, I, I saw i see your face now you wanted a trivia question i wanted, I wanted, that, I wanted to guess i wanted to guess yeah. i wanted to know who, uh, so yeah rogers rogers, rogers would have been a, up there i think just because he doesn't yeah. he just doesn't throw picks but yeah i mean yeah. like so so that's what we can all right so this is this is not a fantasy football podcast but i am curious about this because i i think there's a lot of value in some of the chargers guys at wide receiver hunter henry at tight end but i'm wondering like do you think this will be a high volume Passing attack? Because, I mean, they, they, he didn't throw many. He didn't have any pass attempts in Buffalo. Yeah. 
so that the one guy I bring up when I think about sort of fantasy and who's going to be most effective in terms of their production is Keenan Allen. Yeah. And I, I had a conversation with Keenan Allen in the locker room after that loss at the chiefs in week 17. And he was like, I haven't even thought about Philip Rivers leaving. Cause I can't even, I don't even want to imagine that reality because he and I are so in sync. And he told me that the touchdown catch that he caught in that game was completely off script. Philip looked out to him. And Keenan looked back. They both saw that the, the, the cornerback was playing inside leverage. So instead of running a post, he ran a, an out route. He ran to the corner and was wide open and scored a touchdown. It was completely off script. And they wow. didn't even communicate. It wasn't like a hand signal or anything. It was eye contact. Wow. And so that – Keenan Allen has developed into one of the best receivers in football because of that connection with Phillip Rivers. Those little slants, those out routes, those quick breaking routes where it's all about timing and anticipation and chemistry – does he have that with Tyra Taylor? And more importantly, is Tyra Taylor capable of, ma- of making those throws and also willing to make those throws? Because a lot of those throws are tight windows and you've got to be willing to risk an interception to make those completions on third and three and third and four. And Taylor's not going to do that. He's going to take a sack. He's going to throw the ball away. And he's going to live to fight another day because that's ultimately what Anthony Lynn wants. It could be a recipe for success though. And I know we're going to get into the defense eventually, but like, I think this could be, I think this is definitely, if everyone stays healthy, a top five defense in the league. I think it might be the best defense in football if everyone stays healthy, the amount of talent that they have on this roster. Okay. Um, do we, <laughs> what, you did, did you like that take? No. Is it I, strong for you? No, I think it's a great take. In fact, yeah. I, I don't, I don't disagree with it at all, but I mean, like, I mean, I'm, we're going to say the same thing after the, when we get to the break, but I'm curious, like, is the offensive line. That's that's the other thing, too, is like, does does Anthony Lynn think he can mitigate the issues? Yeah, th- most people would push back on that. I'm like, no, that Chargers, Chargers defense is loaded. Like, it's it's absolutely loaded. Is is it possible that the movement of the quarterback can mitigate the offensive line? And before and, – and, and I have one more follow-up on that, too, that involves Justin Herbert. Like, over under Justin Herbert game started uh, six and a half. Under. Okay. Yeah, I'm going. Like, do you there. think the Chargers are going to give him his 16 games of Tyrod? Yeah. Okay. I, I like this. Go. This goes back to like their time together in 2016. If you go through Tyrod Taylor's career, he's never really got a bona fide shot to start where the where the where the organization is fully behind him as a starter. Right. You know, he got benched for Nathan Peterman. He got benched for Nathan Peterman and wasn't even playing that poorly at the time. So he's never really had that. You know, with the Browns, one concussion, Baker comes in, it's over. And so he's never really had that opportunity to start with, with the confidence and the support of a coaching staff. And Anthony Lynn wants to give that to him because he believes he's, he's his guy. successful. It's his guy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so, and, and the other, the, the other side of the coin is that, uh, you know, they, they are preaching patience. That is the word, the buzzword with Justin Herbert. They are not rushing this dude okay. at all. And you factor in, he has yet to take an NFL practice snap as with any rookie that was drafted because of obviously the, the pandemic and no one's been on the field, but no one knows when he's going to get on the field. And, you know, the one thing that everyone talks about Justin Herbert is he's is as smart as they come. But the question is, can he take that intelligence in the, in the, in the whiteboard room, in the classroom and apply that on the field and process it as fast as he needs to process it. And no one's going to know if he's going to be able to do that until he steps on the field. And so he's already way behind any, where any way behind, yeah. right. And the most important thing is, can you process it on the field? And you factor that all together, and it's like, okay, they're going to give Tyrod a shot. And unless they're like under, like well under five hundred and out of the playoff race, I I wouldn't think Herbert gets on the field until week twelve, week thirteen, probably. Okay, so even if like they're, if they're like three and nine, then maybe it's like, all right, let's yeah, let's they'll throw him out there and see what he's got because you, you got nothing to lose at that. Herbert point. Herbert's actually interesting too, if. Again, like assuming, and it's you seem to indicate that you think Anthony Lynn is not going anywhere unless, unless they go like two. And oh yeah, so I mean, Tom Telesco loves him, okay. and he's the decision maker. I mean, it's 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 modeled. I mean, Tom Telesco worked under Bill Polian for decades, yep. and so the the organization is modeled after what Bill Polian did, which is there's a GM and everything flows through him. The culture, everything is all from the top down. And Tom Telesco, the ownership believes in Tom Telesco, and I I think that's smart because I think he's a great GM. Eventually, the he's done. Gonna, he's done an awesome job putting a right, roster together. Right, but ultimately, the results are going to dictate whether he keeps his job. And then Tom Telesco loves Anthony Lynn. Like okay. he thinks he has the best coach in the NFL. Just really, yeah. I mean, a lot of it is the leadership, and you see that kind of stuff come out where you know he's willing to go talk about you know police brutality and and, and the social justice reform that he's looking for in a, in a really powerful Q and A with with the LA Times. And you know, you talk to the players, and that's how he is every day. You know? Yeah. 
it's 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 down to business. But like when he believes in something, he believes in something, and he's also played in the league and he supports these guys on a human level. Um, they love playing for him. So you, you factor that all together, and you have a lot of the things that you're looking for in a head coach. So well, and, and I would but, just add too, like I don't I don't mean for this to be it misconstrued as like like I think that what he's done this off season in terms of speaking out and being like, you know what, I'm pissed off. I'm not I'm not going to be quiet any longer. Like I mean. I think that that might even buy him like extra time. Does that, I don't, I don't want to be. Yeah. Well, I mean, football is such an interesting game because, you know, it's not like baseball where you can, it's just all numbers. You can throw it in a spreadsheet and figure it out. Like so much of it is emotion. And if a team is galvanized over a common cause like this, that can have a huge impact, you know, cause it's, it's, it's those little plays. It's that one extra burst of effort on one play in one game can make the difference yep. between the playoff appearance and sit on your couch watching the playoffs. No, and so, no. and that's really hard to quantify, but if a coach is out there talking the way he's talking about this topic, when you have a locker room, that's 80, 85% black, like that could be the difference between a guy pulling up or making that tackle. Right. For and sure. so that's why I, that's why I think it's so important. And that's why I think the organization is so behind him because he, you know, it's another overused cliche, but I, what I've learned covering the NFL is that these are overused cliches because they're actually very true. Right. Like he is a, he is a leader of men. Like that's what, this is what he was born to do and people follow him and play really hard for him. And, and once you find that, it's hard to just throw that out, you know? Yeah, And I guess I would say too, like, let's say they go eight and eight and miss the playoffs by uh, half a game or a tiebreaker, or, or they go nine and seven right. and miss the playoffs, miss that last spot by one game, whatever it is, because they're in a tough division. I, 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 I just think it would take a monumental disaster for them to justify firing Anthony Lynn, given that he's had success, that they have a young quarterback that they're trying to train and that, he has been so outspoken during this time when people are looking for leaders off the field as well. Like it would just be, I mean, just be a PR disaster to, to get rid of Anthony Lynn at this point. And as you as you, and I'm not saying they would do that, but your point too, that they love him. And so they're going to roll with him. I do also think the, and this is the last offensive prattling thing, but like, I think Herbert, I, I watch all, I watch all of his games before the draft because Pete Prisco and I were arguing about whether or not he's good. And I don't, I don't think he's, I don't think he's that great. Personally, but I think if you see, well, him, I'm curious why. What 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 stood out to you? His anticipation stinks. Like he has no anticipation, and he's it's all processing. That's what they talk about. It's how yeah. fast can he like? Cause he know like he knows when he needs to make the throw, but he's not. You know, like if he were looking at it on film, be like, oh, right there, that's the throw yeah. I need to make. But he, and he throws it. Every one of them is like it's a processing. second. Buddy. Yeah, but but if you watch what they do, whenever they get him on the move and give him easily defined reads, he seems to make the throw. You know, it's just like a lot of quarterbacks. Like you get them, you roll them out, you let them use their feet, and he gets them in a kind of a, an athletic rhythm. And he looked a little bit better doing that in that quirky Oregon system. So I sort of wonder if, like, you start – you implement this offense with Tyrod Taylor. Like, maybe this is the plan. You implement it with Tyrod. But if, it, if Tyrod's running it as the main guy, that means Herbert's running it at practice. And so yeah, he exactly. gets used to that offense that they want to keep going with Anthony Lynn and then is actually prepped for it instead of having to learn Philip Rivers offense, you know, and, and, and then switch over the following year or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's going to be – I mean, the one thing that he does really well, which he showed in the Rose Bowl, is like he can run the football. He can like run. He's 6'6", six, six, he's 240, yeah. and he can fly. Like for, yeah. at, for that size, and he's physical, like he can run over linebackers, like, and they're going to use that. Like, make no mistake, they are going to run the quarterback in the same vein that the Ravens run Lamar Jackson. Obviously, they're different players. I mean, Lamar Jackson is a generational talent, but that's the approach. Like, put mm. the ball in his hands and let him run because that's, like, one of the best things that he can do. Now, um, I'm, now, and, I'm, worried that I, now I'm worried that I'm, like, like off Herbert. Like, I, I think I'm worried because I, I just don't want to get old takes exposed or whatever, but, like, I'm, I'm petrified. It's that, part of like, the gig. It's part of the gig. No, I know. I know. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. but, like, I'm petrified that – and I'm not rooting against Herbert. Like I hope he does well. But if he has a, if he has a year to like sit, a complete year to sit and learn and work in this offense, he's probably going to come in in year two and be pretty good, or year three, if depending on how Tyrod plays. All right, uh, we could talk Tyrod and Herbert all day, but we need to get onto that number one defense in football. Are they the number one defense in football? We'll tell you after the break. All right. So Daniel Popper made a bold claim about the Chargers' defense, top five team, potentially the number one team, and you know what? I'm not even going to disagree because we talked about Tom Telesco being a good GM. 
Well, he went out and he gets Linville Joseph to plug up the middle of the line. So now they have depth there with Justin, my man, Justin Jones and, uh, and Jerry Tillery, the, the, two, the first round pick from last year. Um, they obviously have the pass rush with Melvin Ingram and Joey Bosa. They desperately needed linebacker help and they have for a couple of years and they got it in yep. Kenneth Murray who they trade, they paid a lot and traded back up to get him. I think with the Patriots, right? Um, yep. And, uh, and then, I mean, we don't have enough talent in the secondary. Let's add Chris Harris. I mean, it's, it's, right. it's, they're loaded in almost every position. Yeah, and so it's, it's so interesting to see them build this defense because I was like going into free agency, I'm like outside corner is what they have to target. That's right. like got to be your number one priority if you're going to go out and, and get a cornerback, get a defensive player. It has to be outside corner because that's where they're lacking in depth and talent. And then they get Chris Harris, who made his all pro and made his name in the league as a slot corner. And then last year switched outside and was like not even close to the same player. He was like a pretty average middle and right. corner. Whereas on the inside, he's like one of the best in football. And then everyone's been kind of throwing smoke screens out between the Gus Bradley, defensive coordinator, Tom Telesco, Anthony Lynn, Chris Harris himself. Everybody is like, well, you know, I'm learning both positions. No one knows exactly where I'm going to play. Hmm. And it, the, the peculiar part of it was they have Desmond King, who has also made an all pro as a slot corner, but had a down year. You know, I was effectively suspended for a game for a violation of team rules. And so kind of had fell out of the graces with the coaching staff. So now they're bringing in Chris Harris, and I fully expect him to play in the slot. Um, but, it, like, when you bring in a guy like that, the goal is to somehow stop the Kansas City Chiefs. That's the goal. That's mm-hmm. what they're doing. That's how, how they're building this. So the more talent and, vers- and versatility you have in the, in the secondary, the easier it is. The two things you need when you're playing the Chiefs, you need speed on defense. And you got to be able to tackle in space. Those yeah. are the two things you need to do. And if you have six defensive backs who can play pretty much every position in the secondary and they all can tackle in space and they are all fast, that gives you a much better shot to beat the Chiefs. And that's ultimately what the Chris Harris signing came down to. Um, but it's going to make them it's going to make them so multiple. They can do so many different things. I mean, they can play Desmond King at slot corner. They can play him outside. They can play him at free safety. They can play him at strong safety. And so you're going to have packages where, you know, Duran James might be in strong safety. And you stage. can line Duran James up at outside linebacker. Right. Like, but you so can line might, him up at like defensive end, honestly. And he would right, be exactly. 10 sacks. But he might be playing a different position in base than he's playing in nickel than he's playing in dime. That's how versatile they are. He could be playing strong safety in base. He'd be playing, you know, nickel back in, in, in nickel. And then he could be playing, you know, dime backer. And just like be playing all these different positions just because he's so versatile. And you could say that for a number of guys. You know, Rayshon Jenkins is another guy who used to be a nickel corner for them and then broke out last season as a free safety, but might be playing dime back before them in dime this year so they can get Nasir Adderley on the field, their second round pick last year, who's another guy that can play corner and safety. So hmm. the more you sort of peel these layers away of the Chris Harris sign, you realize it's all about being as versatile and, and being more unpredictable than they've been in the past, which has been a problem with Gus Bradley's defense. So, so no, I mean, like I, I, all I can think about when you say, and I think you're spot on with the chiefs thing. All I can think about is like, okay, we're in our defense. Ty, where is Tyreek Hill? Oh crap. He's lined up against a, a, a physical tall outside cornerback. This is not going to work. So like with the ability to move all those guys around, you know, you can put somebody like, okay, Tyreek Hill is lined up on the right. Chris Harris is over on the left. Uh, let, let's slide, you know, slide down, um, you know, Derwin and have, you know, bracket. Like there's different ways you can attack Tyreek Hill and not allow him to get vertical on you. And then, you know, like a guy like Derwin can, can, can plop in and, and man up on Travis Kelsey. And while you've got Chris Harris trying to shadow Tyreek Hill, I'm not saying it's going to work because you've got to beat Patrick. Well, you got to get pressure on Patrick Mahomes and, and still play defense on those guys. But, it does seem like that it is catered exactly towards that. Yeah. And I mean, I think that's overlooked sometimes when people discuss like sort of team building in the NFL, like you you play your divisional opponents twice every single year. So ultimately like you're going to build your team to beat those teams because that's six games out of 16, every single season. Uh, I, that's something that sort of, I learned as I started covering the league more is like, that is a priority. And and that's, why the, that's why the AFC East stinks every year because they've been trying to right. take Bill Belichick and Tom Brady for, for 20 years. Like it's, yeah, it's, but the Chargers went 0-6 in the division last year. Ooh. And that was like – that hurt Tom Telesco. Like he was very upset about that. And I understandably so. I mean, they got their ass kicked by everybody in their division. These are the teams that, you, that you're literally building your team to beat. Yeah. Um, so it, it'll be interesting to see. It'll be interesting to see because they really – they played the Chiefs really well last season despite injuries. And despite not having the same kind of talent that they have this year, uh, they, they had one of the best games against Patrick Mahomes in his career when they played him in Mexico City. But Philip Rivers lost that game because he threw like 19 interceptions. Uh, <laughs> they probably they probably win that game if Philip Rivers can throw like you know half as many interceptions. I think it was ended up being six, five or six interceptions. No, it was, um, was it so that many? Oh my God, yeah, he, he threw him to end the game. It was either five or six. And um, 
It was four. It was four. Let's not have four. any, let's not have any oh, Rivers so standard game, here. Okay. He also had a fumble. I, so it's five turnovers. Okay, maybe I'll send you five turnovers. Okay. Anyway, you're not winning a game if you throw four interceptions. That's it. Four or five or six, it doesn't really matter. But, you know, it's it'll be interesting to see because they have schemed him up really well. Gus Bradley has done a really nice job of containing, you know, at, at better than pretty much anyone in the league, containing that offense that has been pretty much uncontainable. Um, you know, and now he's going to add some more pieces. And also they're looking at scheme changes on the defensive side of the ball, the same way they're looking at scheme changes on the offensive side of the ball. They want more pressure on the quarterback. And, and the way they're going to do that is they're going to play a lot more man coverage. You know, Gus Bradley's scheme is that, you know, that iconic Seahawks Legion. Zone three, scheme, yeah, cover all, three, all cover yeah. three. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they're playing it half the time. If you go like watch the all 22, I mean, there are three guys deep on pretty much every play. And, you know, the philosophy is limit explosive plays as best as you can. And if you can limit explosive plays and your front four can get after the quarterback, then you're going to have a shot to win. So, you know, it's that classic bend but don't break mentality. You know, Anthony Lynn wants to be a little more aggressive. He's like, listen, we got Derwin James. We got Joey Bosa. We got Melvin Ingram. We got Kenneth Murray in here. We got Drew Tranquil, who took huge steps last year. We got all these pieces in the secondary. Like, let's stop with the bend but don't break and let's get after some people because we didn't force enough turnovers last year and we did not get after the quarterback. Now. Mm. So you think we'll be seeing more blitzing and more? Oh, yeah. Okay. I think that you'll see a lot. I mean, Gus Bradley has consistently been among the least blitzing teams and defenses in the league every single year. I mean, you can go back to his Jacksonville days, and it's like he's well below league average every year, yeah. pretty much like in the bottom three and in last place in like three of the last five years. He just doesn't blitz. You know, but the idea is if you, you know, it's the opposite of what like a Todd Bowles, you know, defense is, which is like throw as many exotic blitzes as the opposing team as possible and hope that creates confusion and you get some, you know, some turnovers. Uh, it's going to be different this year because Anthony Lynn like was looking at it. And like I go back to it, it all comes back to forcing turnovers, limiting turnovers. That's every, every personnel decision you look at is, is factored into that. They need to force more turnovers on, on defense. So they go out and they get guys who they feel like they can make that happen between Kenneth Murray and, and Chris Harris. And they want to limit turnovers on offense. So they get rid of Phillip Rivers and they bring in one of the, one of the guys who's the best at limiting interceptions in the history of football. And that's what it comes down to. Yeah, Chargers finished twenty first in uh, DVOA on defense last year after being eighth the year before. I, I like, I don't want to chalk it up straight to injuries, but I mean, Derwin James going down is was a huge factor. I mean, that defense changed the second he he got hurt. Yeah, so hundred percent. It's hard not to point to that, you know. Like, it, it sometimes it is really simple. You have like a guy who is in his second season going to be vying for defensive player of the year, and you lose him for the whole season. Yeah. And then the the one, but I would argue that the injury that was just as as consequential was the backup strong safety, Adrian Phillips, who's oh, also yeah. their dime yeah. backer and is like a big, big time leader in that locker room, very well respected guy and like a really solid defensive player. He got injured in week two. So they were on their third string strong safety for more than half the season. And it was a, a, a player, Roger Teamer, who was an undrafted free agent. Uh, in in a defense where you're asking guys to like, st- like cover on the back end and you just. Right. Right. And like, you know, you spend the whole offseason building your defense around one player and Derwin James and yeah. expecting him to do all these things and cover running backs in the flats and blitz. And, you know, like you said, line and linebacker and defensive and all these different places. And all of a sudden he's gone. And then the guy who can do maybe 75 percent of that that you have as his backup is gone. And now you have an undrafted rookie who can do maybe 20 to 30 percent of that on the field and everything sort of falls apart. But they weren't like atrocious on defense. They just couldn't get off the field on third down. And that's what it really came down to for that group. Uh, yeah, and Bosa and Melvin Ingram, 18 and a half sacks is, is, is good, but not, not elite. Not what, not what you're expecting out of them. And I think you'll see more sacks from them this year if they blitz a ton. Uh, okay, so what is a, uh, what's a good season for the Los Angeles Chargers? Like, what, or like maybe what's a, what's a, I, I think they have a high floor and, and maybe a high, I don't, I don't know if Tyron Taylor gives them a high ceiling. I know he gives them a high floor. Yeah. I don't know what they're trying to do. It feels like se- anything less than seven wins is an unmitigated disaster. Yeah, and going back to what you were saying earlier, like it's as long as they avoid disaster, then they can sort of point to 2021 and be like, okay, we got our quarterback in year two. This is sort of when it all comes together for every quarterback, whether you know, in recent history, whether you look at Patrick Mahomes or Lamar Jackson, like it all comes kind of comes together right. in year two. And that's when you can go try and really vie for, for a Super Bowl. And so as long as it's not like, you know, five and 11, even six and 10, I feel like they keep their jobs. Um, but like you said, it's, it's a high floor. You have a, as long as everyone stays healthy on defense you're going to be in every game because that defense is not going to give a lot of points. It's just, right. There's just too much talent. And it's not going to be a very exciting brand of football. You know, the offense is going to be, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be a, a lot of three and outs. 
but it's going to be, it's going to be a lot, pretty much no turnovers. You know, that's going to be the goal of the, of the offense, you know, let the defense win football games and they have a quarterback in Tyra Taylor who, who can do that. And if they can execute all that, be a really, really good defense and limit turnovers and just be game managers on offense, then, you know, I think you're looking at, you know, eight and eight, nine and seven. If it, everything clicks and goes perfectly, then you're probably looking at 10 and six. But I would say, you know, as long as they're around 500, then everyone can sort of point to it like, okay, it's 2021 and that's the make or break year. So this isn't know. necessarily, would, so this isn't, sorry, to interrupt you, but it's like, it's, no, not like all, it's not like an all in year then. I guess maybe That'll I sort of feel like it is, but maybe it's not. I don't know. It, well, I mean, they're only one year removed from making it to the divisional round and in, 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 the, in the playoffs. And, like, they're, they're a really good team. And, like, they're, they had an outstanding defense. And everyone's like – everyone was looking at this team last year. It's like, hey, this could be, the like, your quiet Super Bowl. Every, defense, everybody you know? picked him to beat the freaking Patriots two years ago. Like, anyway. Right. Yeah. Right. But, but I mean, it's, it seems like an excuse, but you look at the injuries, and they were just brutal. You had a weak offensive line to begin with, especially in pass protection. You lose the anchor of that offensive line, Mike Pouncey, in week five. Russell Okun played – he didn't play a full game last year because he got right. injured in the Bears game, and then he, they took him out of the, Jacks, the Jags game because it was a blowout. So you lose your starting left tackle, former pro ball left tackle. You lose your starting center, and all of a sudden you, you've got really nothing on the offensive line. Phillip Rivers loses any confidence in that offensive line, and his deterioration gets exasperated as a result. And then you lose Derwin James. Yeah. on defense and Adrian Phillips. So you have a, a rookie and Roger team on the field. And it's like, you chalk that all up and it's, and they still were like, they had like a within negative 10, maybe negative eight, negative seven point differential. At one point they were like, they were like four and nine and had a positive point differential, something like that. You know, very, like very they were, of them. Yeah. right. They were pretty much in every game. They lost like, you know, 10 games by less than seven points. And, you know, so you look at that, you're like, okay, if we stay healthy, and we can limit the turnovers and just keep ourselves in games and not shoot ourselves in the foot, there's a clear path to being a much better team. And I, I subscribe to that right now because it just, you know, having watched this team last year, like they were a lot closer than the record shows. They lost nine games by one score. That's crazy. Yeah, it was insane. But I mean, it was like, it was like, you know, Groundhog Day. You yeah. get there, you're sitting there in the fourth quarter. Phillip Rivers has the ball with three and a half minutes left. They're down like five, like seven points and he throws an interception. And it's like, again, here we every go again. Day. And it happened like, it wasn't like, you know, three or four weeks. It was every damn week. Yeah, you know? yeah, and so yeah. you're like, you know, if you can just not throw the interceptions, you got a, a shot to win these games. Let the defense close it out. Yeah. All right. All right. Maybe, exactly. maybe, maybe I can tell myself back into the Chargers. This yeah. But it was unlucky. Out. It was unlucky though, because they did, there was a game against the Raiders on Thursday night in Oakland where they had the defense in the field trying to win. And then Josh Jacobs ran like an 18 yard touchdown with a minute left. So it was just like everything went wrong. It was Murphy's law. Two and nine in one score games, and your point and your uh, your expected win loss is eight, and you come out five wins. I mean, this is a team that, in theory, should have a bounce back here. All right, that this great. Thanks a lot, Daniel. Like I needed to get back on the Chargers bandwagon. I moved on in my life to the Colts, and now it got me kind of excited about the idea of the Chargers. But uh, it was a fun talk either way, buddy. Uh, appreciate you taking the time.